good to go tonight. Let's open up a prayer over the word of the Lord and just believe God for a powerful time. How many love God's word? You know, we're looking at not only the word of the Lord tonight, we're also, we've been looking at historic revivals and what we can learn from them today. So Father, we just thank you for your, the heavens open, your glory here tonight, Holy Spirit, for moving in power. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. I just thank you, Lord, tonight for speaking through me everything that needs to be said. And even now, the Holy Spirit is moving upon every one of us that are going to be listening or watching this. I thank you for your Holy Spirit moving upon us or captivating every audience, every person that's going to be hearing this or watching. We need the Holy Spirit to help us. Lord, help us by the Spirit of God, Father, just uh, give you our best ear, our full attention, our focus that will be good, fertile soil of hearts and minds and lives. I thank you as you speak through me like living seeds of truth that's sown into that good soil, watered by the Holy Spirit. And we'll take root, grow, and produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains till Jesus comes. Lord, I thank you for it. I thank you for the winds of the Spirit carrying this out among the nations. It's going to get where it's supposed to, accomplish what it's supposed to. The Bible says it won't return void. It will go forth and accomplish that which the Lord has sent it forth to do. And Lord, we know the enemy tries to steal the seed, but we just, we submit this unto God. We resist the devil. We bind anything that would try to hinder this right now. We commit to back off and go in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you for your angels just clearing that out, and this will be a powerful time in you as we get into the Word tonight in Jesus' name. All right, we're going to look tonight at um, a time for awakening, just continuing in that. We looked last week at John Wesley, and the Lord willing, next week we'll look at Jonathan Edwards and Brainerd. But tonight, I want to look at a, the life of a man by the name of George Whitfield. And um, the scripture I want to use is Habakkuk 3, verse 2. It says this, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, renew them in our day. Isn't that an awesome scripture? Lord, renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Let me read that again. Really look at this, because Habakkuk would have been referring to the great wonders of the Lord that were behind him. Uh, he read about the life of Moses and the Exodus. He would have read about in the life of Joshua, uh, prophet Samuel, how God moved in different times in Israel's history. And Habakkuk says this, Lord, I have heard of your fame, all these awesome things that you've done. I've heard about it, and I stand in awe of it. Renew them in our day. Let us see it now. He says, in our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Well, he knows we need the Lord's mercy. So as I'm reading this, I think about this scripture and how it applies right now. You know, we've been looking at the historical revivals, and I'm going to spend as long as God wants me to on this. We may, the whole rest of this year, we may look at different revivals and, and just glean from them. But this is what God's saying right now. And, you know, we look at the times where God moves so mightily, Historically, I read about these accounts, people that were there, and it's so amazing. And let me just read some things I wrote here. The body of Christ has had a continual issue of backsliding. Let me tell you, I better not ever hear anybody complaining and reading about Israel's constant backsliding and, and bad mouth in the nation of Israel. The body of Christ has no room to talk. We've done the same thing. This, the body of Christ has backslid and backslid through the... Through the uh, you know, through our history, and God has had to continually release revivals to raise us from the dead and to get things back on track. Man desires that control. And every time there's a move of God, man moves in behind that move of God and just changes it into an educational thing, makes it into a denomination. Let me say that again. Every time God moves... Man comes in behind it and changes it into an educational thing and it makes it into a denomination, losing the power and the effectiveness it once had and, and many times even losing the very pure gospel itself. See, one of the things I've been trying to bring home during this series, and man, I hope that I can, is how supernatural the gospel and salvation really is. Salvation, please hear me tonight. I know River of Life knows this, but salvation is not just reading some kind of a prayer. It's not some kind of a ritual. It's not, and that's the problem. 
Matthew 7, 21 through 23 or so should scare every one of us. How many knows we need a healthy fear of God? Because Jesus said, Jesus said, everybody say this, Jesus said. Okay, this isn't my opinion. Jesus said that many on that day, not a few, many will say, Lord, Lord, we did all these things in your name. We prophesied. We cast out demons. We healed the sick. I mean, these are people that have to be Christians. They have to be among God's people. They call them Lord. They're religious. They're around the, the move of God. They're, they're seeing it. They're experiencing the true prophetic and healings and deliverances and all of that. Yet Jesus is going to say to many, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Now, that's a scary scripture because these are people that are religious. They know all about the Lord. They know the lingo. They're among us, but they really truly don't know the Lord, and they're not living a pure life. They're, they're practicing lawlessness means that they live a life of unrepentant sin, and so that scripture should put a fear of God in every one of us, the Apostle Paul said, I bring my body under subjection, least after I've preached to others, I myself become a castaway. Think about that. And so we need to live in a healthy fear of God. But salvation is not just knowing about the Lord. True salvation is so supernatural. It is worth nobody can come unless the Father draw him. But how does the Father draw people? By the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit begins to move. The Holy Spirit draws us to salvation. The Holy Spirit opens us up to salvation. We begin to see Jesus on the cross dying in our place. We see our need for a Savior, our need for forgiveness. And in that place, as we put our faith in Him, we look to the cross, we put our faith in what He did, the Holy Spirit enters us, and we are born again. We are new creation. We will never be the same. And God will begin to process in us. He is the, both the author and the finisher of our faith. He begins that process, but he will see it through completion. How many knows when you're truly born of God, He's not the Holy Spirit is not going to let you get away with stuff anymore? When you're really, truly the Lord's, the Holy Spirit will make you miserable in your sin, and that's a good thing. The scariest thing in the world to me would be that the Holy Spirit would not be working on me. That's scary. And so I know my wife, she, she grew up her testimony. Everybody kind of knows this testimony, but she grew up in sin, never knew the Lord, never really knew anything about the Lord. The only thing, her family were, were totally lost. As far as we know, she's the only person going back as many generations as we know that has accepted the Lord. I mean, there was zero church background, zero Christianity. The only thing she knew about Jesus Christ was from the movie, Jesus Christ Superstar, which was not really the best film, but at least there was a little bit of accuracy about the whole thing as far as the story goes, right? Even though they didn't have him raised from the dead, so they missed that. But um, she, she knew a little bit about the Lord. But whenever she came, here's how supernatural the, salvation is. She's in a car. She's going to commit suicide. She's there and her arms fall down. She feels something. She picks it up. It's a little Bible. Number one, how did that get there? No, nobody can come unless the Father draw him. God put a Bible there. He made sure it was there. I don't know if an angel put it there or a person, but it was there. And she, she got it from a drug deal. She was not uh, around Christians. Nobody, none of her friends would have put the Bible there. It just, it was there, okay? God worked that out. And in that place, she began to read the sinner's prayer. She said, I understood that. And when she prayed it, she said something happened to her on the inside. See, here's what happened. She was opened up into salvation. Now, after that, she said that she began to feel convicted about things. I remember she was saying she was at a church service after she accepted the Lord, moved. She was in a church service, and God put on her heart that you need to quit smoking. So she just put her cigarette money in the offering, and she just quit from that day. But see, there was really no background, but all of a sudden she began to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit Then I need to quit doing this, and I need to start doing this. It wasn't religious people beating her down. It was the Holy Spirit on the inside of her saying, I want you to quit that, and I want you to start doing this over here. How many knows the Holy Spirit is our guide? He leads us into all righteousness. He convicts us of our sin. He's taking us in, he's creating a work in us 
to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? But it's the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. So with all of that, I want to really bring home how supernatural salvation is. Because you can, there was, I'll give you two more things real quick. So there was a a guy that was telling me this. We were at a table, and some of you have heard this story. We were at this table, and he was saying this. At this university here in Texas, they have like an open forum or something. I've never been to this, but he was telling me about it. He's a minister. He said they have an open forum where you can go in there and you can debate. And he said that they've had this, this guy in there. It's a Christian guy going in there, and this university people are there, and he's been debating them. And this is what he told me. He said this has been going on for years. He told me the amount of years. And he said in all these years of debating there, he said, and he was shocked. He's like, not one person has got saved. And he's looking at me like I'm supposed to be surprised. And I'm just sitting there with this blank look like, yeah, I mean, and I'm thinking to myself, why do you think they're going to get saved? You're just arguing with, look, it's not something that you can argue people into. It's not something that you can intellectually debate about it. And let me tell you something. Even if you get somebody to mentally agree with what you're saying, does it mean that they're saved? That's the problem. I think a lot of people have joined a church, but they've never been born again. That right there, we've got a lot. Uh, you look at the greater body of Christ, we've got a lot of tares among the wheat, and that's part of the problem. People say, oh, all these Christians, a bunch of problems. Well, I'm not saying that some of them aren't because I've known some people, okay? But I think that a lot of church problems across there might not be true born-again Christians as much as a bunch of the tares among the wheat we got in there mixed in among us, okay? So... And now here's the other side of the story. I've read about these revivals. I mean, I have read so many things about revivals. I love to read about revivals. This is something that I've done a lot of research on. And one of the things in every major move of God is this. The Holy Spirit just falls on the people, and people start getting saved right and left. It's hard to keep up with. Why? Because it's the work of the Holy Spirit opening them up. And I remember, and just a quick story to bring this kind of home, so... Lindell was telling this story, and of course, he was part of the Brownsville revival, and there was a lot of people saved at Brownsville. That, I would say that was probably the, the main focus of the revival, and it's awesome that it was, but it was the main focus was people getting saved, and I mean, the anointing was so intense there. People, I watched it. I was there. People would run down, all these heathen people off the streets just run down and get saved, but Lindell, in the early days of the revival, Back before there were lines and before a lot of people were coming, there was a lady, just a nice lady from from some uh, type of maybe Presbyterian or Lutheran church or whatever that had heard about the revival, and she had been a really good lady. Um, She was pious. She lived a virtuous life, and she was very actively involved in her church. If I remember the story correctly, she was the type of person that was uh, subservient there. She did a lot of things for the church. She's very active. And she said that she simply came in, just walked in, because back then, before the crowds were there, it was just a typical church service on a weeknight. So she just simply walked in, went to the foyer, picked up a bulletin. She's reading over the bulletin. How many remember the days of the bulletin, right? Now it's an email, right, or some uh, Facebook post. But she, she's reading the bulletin. She's going in, and she goes up toward the front, and she sits down, and the music starts or whatever, and people are going to start worshiping, but she said next thing she knew, she's telling Lyndall this. Years after um, she had been there, um, she said all of a sudden the music starts and she's just going to worship like a typical church service, but she finds herself collapsed on the floor with no idea what happened, and she was just out of it. And Lyndall's just sitting there looking at her tell the story, and he's like, well, that's awesome, then, you know. what?" And she said, well, she said, I, I got up thinking I was there for maybe five minutes or something. And she said to, to hear the preacher closing the service. And she said, I must have been out for like hours. And she said, I had no idea. And um, Lyndall said, well, that's awesome. He said, well, so what is the outworking of this story that you tell me? Well, she said, well, let me tell you. She said, when I went back, she said, I'd, I'd always been a religious person, 
But she said, after that encounter with the Lord, she said, then she said, I began to have a love for the Lord I never had. I began to have a hunger for the Lord I never had. And I began, she said, I would pray before, but it was difficult to pray. But she said, after that encounter, she said, I love to pray and I could just spend time in the Lord's presence. And she said, it revolutionized my life. I'll tell you what happened. She was just religious, and I believe she truly got born of God by the Holy Ghost that night. I believe that's what happened. There is a supernatural aspect to Christianity. And so I really want to emphasize that because in the days to come, as we see revival and river of life, and God's going to do what he's told us he's going to do. And he opens up the harvest. Pastor Scott is not going to be preaching a bunch of religious nonsense. Pastor Scott's going to be preaching the pure gospel. I mean, knows the Lord can catch the fish first, and then he can clean the fish afterward. So last week, we looked at the life of Wesley, and Wesley grew up in a preacher's home. I mean, he... He was very religious. If anybody could be saved by works, Wesley probably would be in heaven just on works. The guy lived a very righteous life. I mean, he served the Lord with all of his heart, but yet he never knew the Lord till later on in life. After his encounter with the Moravians, his near-death experience, how I many of those near-death experiences make you really think about things? And he was with the Moravians, and, and then, at the, remember the story, he found himself at Aldersgate, and he said, as, as they were reading about the book of Romans, and they were reading about uh, true salvation, and it was Martin Luther's expounding on those, he said that his heart was strangely warmed. This was the first move of God in his life to open him up unto salvation. And then after he was truly born again, he went forth really being used of God in a mighty way. But I want you to see the same type of pattern with George Whitfield. But what I want you to notice about Whitfield is this. Wesley grew up in a preacher's home. He grew up very religious. And Whitfield could not have been more different. Here's, here's Whitfield's story. Whitfield's parents owned a tavern. So how many of you guys have ever seen Gunsmoke before? Some of y'all are so young. Come on, man. This is, okay, the Long Branch Saloon, okay? <laughs> Whitfield's parents owned the Long Branch Saloon, all right? And so um, even though Wesley grew up in strict religion, Whitfield grew up quite the opposite. Whitfield said about himself, he said he was a self-confessed liar, a thief, a gambler. He was addicted to filthy talk, cursing, foolishness, and fantasy. He was a very worldly young man, that had a talent for mimicking and mocking preachers. Of course, he, he became a great preacher. So after his parents divorced, even though that was not as um, widespread back then, you see, but after his parents divorced, he went off to Oxford. He lived in a time that England was persecuting Christianity. Now, you guys remember from last week, us talking about every sixth house was making and selling gin. And all of the persecution against Christians, remember 2,000 ministers were expelled from their pulpits. Remember how they treated Wesley's dad, uh, Samuel Wesley. Okay, this was a time of persecution against Christians in England. And Whitfield was, after his parents divorced and he went to Oxford, he found himself lonely and disillusioned about his way of life, how it had turned out, and he got deadly serious about spiritual matters and about his future. He began to really think about, now that he, he left home, his family fell apart, um, he, he got deadly serious about his personal future and about his personal spiritual walk. So John Wesley's brother, Charles Wesley, who I didn't really talk about last week, but Charles ministered with his brother and was a psalmist. Okay, he wrote Beautiful Worship. But Charles invited Whitfield to join their holy club at Oxford. So they basically had like this little group of people that they felt were dead serious about spirituality. And it was a group that was devoted to prayer, seasons of fasting, Bible study, and strict religious activity. And that's the way Wesley grew up. So to him, that was normal, and Charles as well. But they invited Whitfield to be a part of their group, the holy club. 
But the problem was the holy club was about outward legalistic religion, but it wasn't about being born again and transformed from the inside out. When the Lord enters our lives, he's not going to... You ever, you ever seen the picture of where somebody uh, took like a pig or something, just slapped some lipstick on the pig? <laughs> God doesn't try to do it from the outside in. He doesn't want us a bunch of whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. How many knows when the Lord's at work in our lives, he changes us from the inside out. Once you have a new heart, then you're going to begin to act different. You're going to begin to talk different. Your life is going to be different. But those in this holy club, it was all about the externals. And that's all some people understand. I've, I've witnessed to my fair share of people down through the years. There are some people that absolutely do not understand Christianity. There's even some Christians that don't. They're so focused on the do's and don'ts. They don't really have a relationship with the Holy Spirit to guide them. It's all about do this and don't do this. That's all they understand. But once you get on the, the Holy Spirit is truly in you and you develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit and, and you're conformed to the image of Christ, you fall in love with the Lord and you're not wanting to do certain things because you love the Lord. And you're wanting to do other things because you love the Lord. All right, so Whitfield was introduced, though. Even though he was a part of this holy club, everything was about externals. But Whitfield was introduced to a book entitled this, The Life of God and the Soul of a Man by a man named Henry uh, Skogel. This book, radically contradicted what Whitfield believed. Like the Wesleys of his time, Whitfield believed that his disciplined lifestyle of goodness would save him, that he could be good enough to earn his salvation. This book caused him to realize that he must be born again or be eternally damned. Thus, he cried out to God, Lord, if I am not a Christian, or if I am not a real one, for Jesus Christ's sake, show me what Christianity is, that I might not be damned at last. From that moment, Whitfield wrote this about himself. He said, from that moment when he cried out to God, he said, did I know that I must become a new creature? He knew it. He cried out to God and said, Lord, if I'm not really truly a Christian, please show me that I can be saved. And he began to realize I've got to be a new creation. These outward things are not going to get me into heaven. So as he cried out, listen to this, over the next year, Whitfield began to really cry out to God for a year. He was seeking God. He was crying out, Lord, I need to know you. I want to be a true Christian. I want to be born of God. As he cried out to God over the next year, God did visit this young zealot and save him. After he was born again and he knew it, the Holy Spirit bore witness with his spirit that he was a child of God, right? He began preaching. Now, let me just stop there because I want to tell a story that really grieves me. This is kind of a story that I personally know this individual. My, my wife and I ministered many years ago to somebody, and in this particular situation, there was a ministry that we were working in conjunction with that was helping people to basically kind of come off the streets, and, and it was uh, feeding and clothing people and helping people uh, get a roof over their head and things like that. And my wife and I met a lot of different people during this time and prayed with them, and God really delivered some of them, healed some of them, mightily moved in their life. It was very powerful. And there was this one young person that was coming in, and this individual, they wanted that ministry. It wasn't ours. We were working with them, but they wanted that ministry to give them a roof over their head, food to eat, this and that and the other. And, of course, they did. And this person began to go to the church over there, I knew them, but they were going to that church, and they got active, and this, that, and the other. And God began to move in their life, but to be honest with you, um, 
I always kind of wondered about it because they were up and down. And I remember later on in life, this person, it was sad I heard about this, but this person, I guess, got offended or something. And now they've turned totally back to the world and they don't, they don't even know the Lord, don't even claim to be a Christian anymore. And I got to thinking about it and I come to realize this. In John chapter 6, Jesus had fed the 5,000. Remember the story? And he went across the lake, and all of a sudden he gets over there, and there's all these people that were there. In John chapter 6, Jesus wasn't pulling any punches. I mean, the people were there, and he said this. He turned to them and basically said this. You can read it for yourself. You're only following me because I fed you food. And so he says something that it's almost like deliberately was going to offend them because they, he knew that, that the Jewish community would not be okay with cannibalism. And he told him, he said, I tell you what, unless, you know, you follow me because I fed you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And he had a huge group of people following him. How many knows Jesus wasn't really overly concerned about being Mr. Popular? And it says that all those people deserted him that day. And Jesus didn't go running after him saying, oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry, I was too harsh. I, uh, maybe I shouldn't have said it that way, guys. Come on back, and I'll tone down my message. Jesus didn't do that. As a matter of fact, Jesus turns to the 12, and he says, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, well, Lord, we don't really have anywhere to go. We gave up everything to follow you, and also you're the one that has the words of life. In other words, Peter was saying, I don't really understand what you're saying either, Lord, but we're in this for the long haul. <laughs> we done burned the plow, man. We're with you, Lord. I mean, we don't understand either, but, but after Jesus died and rose from the dead, and he inst well, actually, on the night of Passover, when he instituted communion, I imagine probably by the Holy Spirit, they began to understand what Jesus was actually saying when he broke the bread and he said, this is my body. And when he passed out the cup and said, this is my blood, do this in remembrance of me. I would imagine that they started to understand what he was actually talking about. But Jesus knew that those people were following him for the wrong reasons and he confronted it. And they forsook him. So George Whitfield, after he got saved, he began to preach. And one of the first places he preached, um, Sunday, June 27th, his mother and a bunch of his relatives, these were people, now listen, these were people that were a bunch of heathens that hung out in the tavern, came to hear him preach. They probably, I'm assuming, were saying to themselves, man, we knew old George back when he was, you know, this guy. Let, we need to go hear him preach. You see, I can't believe that he got saved as a preacher because I remember him standing on the tables drunk making fun of preachers. So let's, go, let's all go hear him preach. I think that they went out of curiosity. But as he began to sincerely preach, mixed feelings were present as he preached. But the crowd was shaken to the core. Some thought he had lost his mind, but others were deeply impacted. Wesley urged Whitfield to go to Georgia, to Savannah. There was an orphan house there that they ministered at. So upon his return, though, from Savannah, this is what I want you all to please hear this. It says, upon his return from Savannah, he goes back to England, just like Wesley, the Anglican church rejected Whitfield. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear the pure gospel. How many know some people just want their religion? You saw that in the life of Jesus whenever he ministered. You would think that they would want eternal life. But I mean, the Pharisees and Sadducees, some of them hated Jesus and did not want him. They did not want what he had to offer. They wanted their dead, dry religion. So Whitfield comes back to England. He's realizing the Anglican churches were being shut to him. At one time, he had favor, but now there was no more favor. He was scandalized by preaching the new birth 
as a thing which many baptized persons of the Anglican Church needed for true salvation. How many knows that this whole thing about just baptize a bunch of kids and they're going to heaven is a bunch of garbage, right? And that's what he was coming up against. He was saying, look, I know you guys joined a church, and I know you went through some type of baptism, but I'm going to tell you that unless a man is born again, he cannot have eternal life. And you know what? They didn't want to hear it. So he was openly denounced by many. They denied him pulpits. The plain truth was the institutionalized Church of England of that day was simply not ready for people like Wesley and Whitfield, and they were vexed by these men that were calling them out of their spiritual slumber, and they were waging war on the devil. See, they were vexed by him. But like Wesley, he was rejected by the institutionalized denominational church of his day, but he also went out to the highways and the byways to win the lost because of the intercession of the Moravians. Now remember this, without powerful prayer and intercession, there will never be a revival. And the Moravians were in constant prayer. And because of their deep prayers and intercession, the spiritual climate was such that the masses began to show up to hear Whitfield preach, to hear Wesley preach on the streets. Countless people found true salvation in Jesus Christ. And like we later read in the Cane Ridge Revival of Kentucky in around 1805, this was, you know, 50 years earlier or so, both Whitfield and Wesley say that even as they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to the crowds, that they said that some people that were in the crowds were hit by the power of God and fell out on the ground under the power, but later they got up having found true salvation. Whitfield, after 34 years of faithful ministry, he visited almost every town in England, Scotland, and Wales crossing the Atlantic seven times and capturing the souls of Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, he publicly preached an estimated 18,000 messages. Whitfield never, listen to this though, just to honor George Whitfield, he never forgot his sinful past that God brought him from, and he were made humble all the days of his life. Isn't that awesome? I'm gonna tell you something, I'm actually gonna read something here in a moment out of this book, Cry for me, Argentina. But I want to say something as I'm beginning begin to close this out here. Pet doctrines and traditions of men. The religious spirit. In Mark chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees. How many have ever read the New Testament? How many have read where Jesus gave the seven woes to the Pharisees. I mean, you read that. Remember that? Woe unto you, Pharisees. Remember that? All right, so before you ever think Pastor Scott's being a little rough on people, just go back and read the woes, okay? Because Pastor Scott's pretty nice compared to that. But Jesus was rebuking the, the religious people of his day, the Pharisees, and he said this. He said, thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition." that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Jesus told them, he said, because of the traditions of men, the pet doctrines of men, you have nullified the word of God. And Jesus goes on to rebuke the Sadducees. Here they come, and they're going to try to trick him. Oh, this guy married, then, then she died, married again, died, married again. Who's he going to be? They're trying to give some religious... How many know the religious people love to debate? Boy, it's annoying, isn't it? And they did that to Jesus. And they tried to trap him and trick him into saying something so they could, you know, get on their Facebook, right, and blast him. <laughs> but anyway, here's what Jesus said to the Sadducees. Jesus answered and said unto them, You are mistaken, not understanding the Scriptures or the power of God. Jesus basically told them, he said, you are in error. You don't understand because you really don't understand the word of God and you certainly don't know the power of God. And let me tell you something. Some of these religious people of our day, they come across, remember the seven woes, Pastor Scott's nice, okay? But some of the religious people today 
or some of the most pompous, arrogant people you could ever imagine running into. Pride, puffed up, would not, they think they have great knowledge. Listen to them. They want to suck you into a debate. They can show off how brilliant they are in God's word, but here's the thing. Some of them, in all their arrogance, speak continually against the Holy Spirit. And if they simply just knew the book of Matthew, not even the other 65 books of the Bible, just knew the book of Matthew, they would be scared to keep speaking against the Holy Spirit. Hello? So I'm going to talk just for a moment about the religious, and then I want to read you something. I wonder, among religious circles today, among different types of churches and ministries and and outreaches and all these different things, the programs and all the big events that we have going on and everything out there, I wonder some things. Number one, I wonder how many people have not truly had an encounter with Jesus Christ for themselves, but only encountered religion. Did y'all hear what I just said? You know, you preach and somebody says, well, you know what, preacher, I just don't believe in Jesus. You know what I would say? You know what, if you ever met him, you would believe. The reason why you don't believe is because you've never had an encounter with the Lord. And let me tell you, I, man, I love this about Steve Hill. He used to tell me this and everybody else. He said, look, people need an encounter with Jesus Christ for themselves. I think a lot of people have only encountered religion. They've only encountered the, the outward uh, legalistic, do this, don't do that. The, the different things that Christianity offers, the different programs, the social clubs, the entertainment, They've had all of that except an encounter with Jesus Christ. And because of that, many of them are not even saved. I wonder how many have not truly had an encounter with Jesus Christ. They've grown up in church, some of them. I wonder how many people out there, they go, they, maybe they've gone to church for years, but because of the traditions of men and because of, of pet doctrines, that they, the, the group that's there just doesn't like tongues or whatever, I wonder how many people could have been baptized in the Holy Ghost in fire. But because they were taught against it or they, it was never exposed to them, they missed out on something huge in their life that would have revolutionized their whole life. You know, Derek Prince said this about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I believe it to be true. He said, once you accept Christ as your Savior, he said, after that, once you get baptized in the Holy Ghost and with fire, he said, that is basically your introduction to the supernatural in Christianity. Whew. Isn't that true? But how many people out there are hungry, and they've never encountered it? It's been deliberately kept away from them. We desperately need the baptism in the Holy Ghost. We need a prayer life. And I could go on and on about the need for it, but unless, Jesus said, once you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, he said, once you're clothed with power from on high, then you'll be my witnesses. The reason why we're not effective is because we don't have the power of God like we need to in our lives. And Caius says, amen. And then as we keep going, and also they don't like tongues, I'm gonna tell you something. We need to be to have that prayer language. I'm telling you, Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. And not only that, but the Bible says that we always don't know how to pray, but Romans 8, Paul says, but when you don't, the Lord will help you in your weakness, and he will pray through you by the Holy Spirit. And the book of Jude says, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. We need it. it you utter mysteries. You get revelation. You, it strengthens you spiritually. It's a desperate need. When John the Baptist was talking about Jesus, he said, look, you know, what, what did John say about Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away sins of the world. But what's the next thing John said about him? He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. But how many people are kept away from it? Also, I wonder how many people could have been healed and even died prematurely because they're not taught that God wants to heal them. I wonder how many people could have been healed. 
but they belong to some group that taught them that that only happened back 2,000 years ago with the apostles that died off with them. You talk about a false doctrine. That's, that's heretical. Let's quit being so nice about it. Remember the seven woes. Okay, Pastor Scott's being nice. But that is actually heresy. It's false teaching, and it should be condemned. How many knows Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? He is our healer, and he paid for it in his back. And it kind of angers me that Jesus was willing to take stripes on his back and blood come out of his back. And how many have seen the passion of the Christ to go through all of that for our healing? And then you're going to have a group of people say, well, it's not God's will to heal. You know, if we would start just obeying the Bible, anointing people with oil and praying for the sick and stepping out in faith, you'd be surprised how many more people be healed. Sometimes you've got to fight on your hands. Sometimes there's other factors that play, and I understand that. But still, it is God's will to heal. Peter said that he bore in his body our sins that were dead to sin, alive unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Also, I wonder how many people, and this is a peeve, I wonder how many people could have simply been set free. But there's so many pet doctrines and traditions of men that teach that once you get saved, there's no need to be delivered from anything. Are you kidding me? But I'm telling you that there's major denominations out there that don't believe Christians can have any type of generational curse, can have any type of deliverance issue or demon or anything else, and they preach against it. Well, listen, I love everybody. But I'm going to tell you, my wife and I have cast too many demons out of too many people for too long to argue that stupid point. And let me tell you something, on the other side of their deliverance, you know what happened to them? Many of them were supernaturally healed, sometimes from incurable diseases. Some of them were delivered from tormenting mental illness. Other people besetting sins that was haunting them the rest of their lives left them with that evil spirit leaving them. They were liberated. They were set free. And I'm going to tell you the power of those generational curses can be broken. And let me tell you something. Jesus paid a dear price for it on the cross when he hung on that tree becoming a curse for us. Blood dripped from his body for six hours. He paid for our deliverance. And I wonder because I've seen so many people in Christianity through the years that have lived defeated, tormented lives. They could be free. Now, some people blame things on the devil, and they're their own worst enemy. But there are times when it is the devil, and they need to be liberated. I could tell a lot of stories here, a lot of stories. We've seen a lot of people set free. All right, and I wonder also how the traditions of men have hindered so many people in so many different areas. I'll give you an example. The communion table is so powerful, as often as you will. Yet man comes in and tries to control everything, makes the communion table something that people are afraid of, something that you have to take at church, something that a preacher has to administer. It, it can only be done, you know, maybe once or twice a year. Do you understand what I'm saying? The devil knows how powerful the communion table is, and so he's been working through religious demons through pet doctrines and traditions of men to make sure that you don't get the benefits of it. The power of water immersion. I was just listening to a wonderful preacher. He's been in the ministry 46 years. His father was a preacher. His grandfather was a preacher. Powerful man of God. Went through a tremendous spiritual warfare. Tremendous. And on the other side of it, he was just, Lord, you got to help me. He was really just struggling he had been through so much, and it, just the hurt, the pain, the trauma. And here he is out there baptizing all these young people. And the Lord spoke to him and said, you need to get water immersed tonight. He said, yes, Lord. He said he went under the water, and he said as he came up, there was this deep groan that came out, and all that hurt and pain came out of him. Hello? I wonder how many people, you know what? We just simply do it a couple times a year here. If there's somebody... Uh, accepts the Lord and wants to be say, uh, baptized, we, we baptize whenever. But as a corporate body, we open it up a couple times a year. We have a period of prayer and fasting. I encourage people to take time to really fast and pray. Seek the Lord. Show, ask him to show you if there's any sin to confess, any person to forgive, whatever. Ask him to show you things you couldn't see before. 
and let God do a work in you. And then we come together after that and we take communion kind of in a special way where we really bring our lives under the blood. And, and then my wife and I anoint everybody with oil, which I'm going to talk about here in a moment. But we say, if you want to get water immersed, and most people come out. And I'm going to tell you what, I've, I've sat there, my wife will bear witness to this. We've water immersed people that were so hit by the power of God that we had to help them back up out of the water. We've seen people in the waters of baptism, people have been baptized before many times, but we've seen them supernaturally healed of things. Did y'all hear what I said? And we've seen them delivered from things. Delivered. Evil spirits, whatever, leaving their lives. We've seen them separated. So the Lord uses the communion table. He uses the waters of immersion. I remember a powerful story, Rodney Howard Brown's brother, Basil, is a friend of mine, and he was telling me that he had a baptismal service. And the way that he felt led to do it that night, they had a big old tub in the middle of the sanctuary, and they had the, the, like the plastic on the floor. And people were just simply coming up, and he was just praying for them, and they'd get hit by the power of God, go under, and they'd have people help them back up. So he said as he was doing this, there was a man that was there. You guys have heard this, some of you, but he was, his heart was so weak from heart attacks, that circulation was so bad that his legs had started turning like a black color and he didn't have enough energy to even get around. And Basil and them had this baptismal service. I mean, it's just somebody that was a Christian, somebody had been baptized before, all of that. But the guy goes down, he wants to get water baptized. He goes down, you know. And um, Basil prays for him, hits, get hit by the power of God, falls under, they help him up, he goes and sits down. Did you know God healed that man? that in, before he left that service, his legs went from being black to normal color. He was healed in the baptismal. And I'm a friend of mine that, uh, Todd, that pastors out in the North Georgia Revival, God showed him, he was telling me about it. He said he was walking in the sanctuary. He's really praying for revival. And one of the things God dealt with him about was he had a group of elders at, a, I guess, a previous church that he had pastored. And um, these guys really got crossways with him. And the Lord spoke to him. He said, I want you, though, to go, and I want you to apologize to him. And he said, what? I mean, because he felt like they all owed him an apology. How many have ever felt that way? And maybe you were right, because I felt that way, and I thought about it a long time. I thought, you know, I'm not wrong. But anyway, he said that the Lord still told him, said, you still need to go apologize to him. So he, man, he said it was the most humbling thing because he did not feel that he really owed all them an apology, but he did it anyway. And when he went to each one of them and he, he said, please forgive me for anything on my part, he said the heavens over his church kept opening. He did it, I think, seven times. He said we'd go back and have a service, and he said the heavens were even more open. And then he would do it again. He'd find somebody. So, and he said the Lord was, had his number. He'd run into people he hadn't seen in years. It's like the Lord lined it up for him to run it because he didn't want to do it. And so he'd, he'd you know, for, pray, you know, he'd say, please forgive me. The heavens would open more. So then after he finished what God told him to do, he's walking in the sanctuary praying, and he had a vision of the baptismal, which hadn't had water in it for a while, and he saw water in it in the vision, and he saw fire on the water. And God spoke to him that he was going to put his fire in the water. You know, he said, okay. So he began to open it up for just baptismal, for anybody wanting to, to go deeper in Christ, whatever you need, I believe God's going to meet you in the water. And um, there's been so many testimonies, I don't even know where to start, but I remember as him and I were talking, and um, he pulls out his phone, and he's sitting there, he's like, look, but I want to show you, and he's showing me some worship from his church, and he's got tears in his eyes, you know, he says, look at this picture, and he's got his iPhone, and he pulls this picture up, and there's a CAT scan of this lady, and she's like this in the CAT scan, and there's little black dots all throughout her body, cancer, and he said, well, that was before the baptism. Here's the one after. Swipes it over and says, look, and there was nothing. God purged out all the cancer out of the body. So God uses the communion table, doesn't he? God uses waters of immersion. And I could tell stories about anointing with oil. You know, Jesus sent them out, and, it, and some of those that were sent out as the 70 took oil with them to anoint and pray for the sick. And it said as they anointed them, the sick were healed and demons left people. That usually kind of goes together. A lot of sickness is demonic. But they, the Bible's just all through the scriptures has the anointing with oil. And um, 
My wife and I have seen a lot of people as we know what we do and pray for people. The book of James says, if any is sick among you, let him call upon the elders to anoint with oil and the prayer of faith will bring healing. So we've seen a lot of people heal, a lot of people delivered. There's something about it. And in the Old Testament, you see the pattern. The way that God consecrated Aaron, Aaron was the, the priest that was going to go into the Holy of Holies. And for him to be really consecrated, part of that consecration was that there had to be blood shed and that blood spiritually cleansed him. And they even took the blood and put it on his right earlobe, which represents your thought life, his right thumb, which represents the works of your hands, and his right big toe, which is your walk. And his life was cleansed by the blood. And then, obviously, they had to water baptize him, water immerse him as well. And they poured the holy anointing oil on him. That consecrated him to go into the Holy of Holies. So my point is this. This is scriptural but traditions of men get in there. And even though it should be so powerful that we're having all these testimonies of healings and miracles and deliverances in the baptismal, all these testimonies of people anointed with oil and miracles broke out. We should be having all of that, but pet doctrines and traditions of men come in, and just like Jesus said, He said, you nullify the word of God by your tradition. Traditions of men come in and says, well, we got to do it this way and that way. And they so ritualize everything. It's such a dead, dry, powerless ritual. Nobody's getting healed. Nobody's getting delivered. It's just a ritual. But it should be powerful. Do you see what I'm saying? This is a spiritual war. We are coming up against religious demons. Did you know that there's a whole class of demon spirits that serve the devil? So just picture, you know, you got like a military, right? You got the Marines, you've got the Army, you got the Air Force. Well, the devil's got this group, like a cult spirits. He's got this group over here. And then he's got all of his little buddies he really likes. These are the religious demons. And you know what their purpose is? to go into the life of Christians and churches and make them lukewarm, powerless, ineffective, full of traditions of men with no power. And sometimes people have argued and debated, and I'm basically like this about it, and I've kind of shut down some of that because I'm like, when's the last time you laid hands on a sick person and they were healed? Oh, well, it's like, let's just quit dancing around the issue here because you want to debate and argue with me. How about Mark chapter 16? These signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they will speak in new tongues. When's the last time you spoke in tongues? They will cast out demons. When's the last time you cast out a demon? Well, they will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. When's the last time you laid hands? So let's quit all this debate. And I love what David Hogan, he's out in the mission field. You don't have to deal with as many religious demons when you're out ministering to a bunch of lost people. It's a lot easier. Nobody's arguing with you about theology. You're just out there, do it. You read the Bible, and you just do what it says. It's amazing how that works. And David's out there, and he says, sometimes he says, i got to come into the States and minister. And he said, it never ceases to amaze me. He said, there'll be somebody there with a demon. And he said, all of a sudden, all the Christians want to argue and fight about whether he's oppressed, obsessed, possessed, whether it's in, on him, around him, whatever. And he said, I got an idea. Why don't we just quit arguing about it and just cast the demon out of the guy and then rejoice at the liberty that Jesus gave that man? How about that right there? <laughs> God help us. But, you know, it's, it would be more funny if it wasn't so many ruined lives because of it. I mean, we can laugh about it, but there's an element of it that's not funny. There's people that are tormented. But it's these stupid traditions of men and pet doctrines. And I remember that, thankfully, by the grace of God, because I'm about to read something and close with that, but I'm, I'm not smart enough to pull this one off. But by the grace and mercy of God, probably my parents praying for me, 
I never got mixed up with a lot of that stuff. I went to Bible school, and I saw these other people that were trying to make a name for themselves and meet this person, shake this hand, work here, climb the ladder, go into this. That. And I always thought it was just a bunch of weasels trying to weasel their way into this, that, and the other. I never really cared for it. And then I got in the church world, and God baptized me in fire. I got exposed to revival. And thank God, I never, ever had a, any of that religious garbage on me. I was just open to what God wanted to do. And all these other people, it seemed like I was around so many religious people, though, that were just like, well, I don't like this. I don't, I don't like the shaking. I don't like the falling down. I don't like the... The, the weeping and groaning. I don't like the laughing. I don't like the tongues. I don't like this. It's like, well, get over yourself, man. The Holy Spirit's moved. I never, I, it never bothered me. Thank God. It never bothered me. I never got all religious. I never got infested with all those pet doctrines and traditions of men. And, and because of that, God's really moved in my life. So I just encourage you, I, when Brother Ralph comes this year, I'm going to specifically ask him to share about that because he grew up in church and he said that when he went to Brownsville and he started seeing revival and the freedom there, I forget all the details and I don't want to ruin it because he's got kind of a hilarious testimony. How many of you guys love Brother Ralph? Man, he's talking about them bell bottoms, man. I'll never look at him the same after that. But he, anyway, you had to be here for that one. But he, he's, um, he was saying that some of these things offended his traditions of men, pet doctrines, things he grew up in. And he said his, he'd look over and his wife would be like big-eyed, like, oh, Lord, Ralph ain't going to like this one, you know. And God had to do a work in him, so I'm going to get him to share on that. But how many of you guys want to be wide open for whatever God wants to do in your life? Amen? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this, and, and we're going to pray for those that want prayer. But this is a book, if you're hungry for revival, a book called Cry For Me, Argentina, written by Edward Miller, who is a, a missionary to um, Argentina back when Argentina was like a, a very difficult soil. It was kind of like the burial ground, if you will, of missionaries that went. Very difficult. The heavens were brass. People were not interested. Anybody that was religious was just Catholic. And he went there. And he said that he was ministering to people and he never saw anybody saved. It was the most difficult place. He had seen people saved in other places and just being frustrated, God spoke to him and said, Edward, I want you to quit going out and doing all of this uh, evangelizing. And I want you to pray just like you would work 40 hours a week. I want you to begin to punch in in the morning and I want you to pray eight hours a day. And Edward Miller thought, well, man, okay, I'll do whatever God tells me to do. But every missionary friend gave him a hard time. Oh, you're just saying that because you're lazy. You don't want to get out there and go witness. And, you know, and he said, no, I've heard from God. Anyway, as he began to pray, then he got his personal breakthrough. He felt the Lord really begin to move in his life after a while of praying. It was hard. And then God told him, I want you to gather others to pray. And he said, Lord, they won't come. He said, well, make the invitation. And the Lord said, on top of that, you're going to start it at this time, and you're going to go till midnight and tell them up front, if you're not going to come and pray the whole time, don't even bother to show up. And Edward said, my Lord, they weren't going to come the first. And now, if you're telling them that, he said, nobody's going to come. There was three people came. How many does it doesn't take a whole lot of people? Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of them. Three people came. And he said that they began to pray, and it was as dead and dry as you can imagine, like it was for him when he started. And every night after that, he would ask him, man, did anybody hear anything, see anything? He was desperate. And finally, after this went on for a while, a young lady says, well, she was shy. I felt the Lord wanted me to go smack the table back there, but I felt really stupid, and I wasn't going to do it. And Edward thought, well, dear Lord woman, if God spoke to you something and said, look, here's what we're going to do. We've been desperate. This is as dry as a prayer meeting as I've ever been in my life. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go smack the table. Then he's going to do it. She's going to do it. You can go last. But we're going to smack that table. Now. So they go, and they whack the table. And he said, as soon as she hit. Now, why does God do that? Nobody knows. God just does what he wants to do. She hits the table. He said a wind blew in from like the northeast corner into that place, knocked him out. 
He said that the guy that was a backslid individual was speaking in tongues under the table. She's weeping. The young lady says, me too, Lord, gets hit by the power. He said, more than that, he said, something broke in the heavens that night. So then he began to uh, go out and evangelize. I want to give you kind of some backstory behind this. They had to pray through very difficult soil. Sometimes you're in a place that's dead spiritually. It's oppressed. The heavens are brass. It's difficult. But prayer is going to break it open, okay? So I'm just going to read to you Edward Miller. Um, It says this, Isaiah 44, verse 3, I will pour water on him that is thirsty, and I will pour floods upon dry ground. How many are thirsty for more of the Lord? And Edward Miller writes this, invite the people to pray. I looked around me, so he goes now, and he's speaking. After they got their breakthrough, he's going now to speak at some of the churches. This is a funny story I'm about to read. But he goes to speak at some of these churches that are pretty dead. And as he's at this church, God spoke to him. He said, Lord, what am I going to preach on? And and God spoke to him, invite the people to pray at this church. He said, I looked around me at the large congregation of Slavic-speaking folk. A long preliminary program had finally finished, and the pastor had announced that I was to speak. And now only the only word God had given me was invite the people to pray. So he's supposed to preach, but God told him, don't preach, just invite everybody to pray. And he said to him, Edward said to himself, what kind of message is that? But having begun some months before to walk the road of implicit obedience to what he felt the Lord saying to him, he said, I was ready to obey the word of the Lord. So he invited, got up and invited the people to pray. And immediately they went down to their knees. And before Edward said, before I had time to realize what was happening, the Holy Spirit had begun to fall on the people, approximately 400 people, as they began to cry. Several received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Something had broken that prayer meeting when they whacked the table. Amen. And they had been in prayer. They'd been interceding. Others with cries of repentance sought their way back to the cross. But here comes religion. Y'all ready? <laughs> the pastor was astounded wholly unaccustomed to these manifestations in his church, though he was Pentecostal in label. Quickly rang his bell to call the people to order. Now, I read this, and I started laughing. What type of bell is this? He had him a little bell on the pulpit, you know, ching, 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 or was it one of these that's hung here, you know, like a big one, like a, or maybe like a gong. You remember the gong show? And I was wondering, what type of bell does this guy have? But he started ringing the bell to call the people to order. And obediently, they all became silent and took their seats again. He killed the move of God, man. And so now, boom, the pastor, notably perturbed in a deep commanding voice, Brother Miller will now speak. And so Edward Miller said, well, God hadn't changed his mind since last time he told me to have the... (laughs) So Edward Miller gets up and he says, brethren, let's pray. So down on their knees, they go again. (laughs) No sooner did they begin to pray that the Holy Spirit began to move upon them again. There were more that were filled with the Holy Spirit. The noise increased until the pastor couldn't stand it no more. Here he, come. Here he comes again, right? And so any, any more deviation from the customary ultra-formalism and ritualism, he began to ring his little bell again, calling the people to attention. He sounded uh, very scold, uh, scolding them sternly. They obeyed, and the service returned back, and and he said to, he said, brethren, God is here. He said, now Brother Miller is going to come and preach, okay? So Edward Miller once again says, well, he's thinking to himself, my Lord, I mean, God told me to have him pray. I don't know what to do. So Edward Miller gets back up a third time and says, brethren, I believe God is here. Let's pray. <laughs> Down they go again to pray. Again, the same process. The bell ringing, the scolding, the service returned to me, (laughs) repetition of the call to prayer again. This was a real power struggle, wasn't it? And the Holy Spirit was outpoured by the fourth time. There was no more bell, no more scolding. The Holy Spirit continued to move and apparently unoffended by the repeated interruptions the pastor stood by observing until he himself was moved upon by the Holy Spirit and began to call out to God. It was just simply new to him. He didn't know. He thought, he thought it was a bunch of emotional hype. At last, the pastor had understood that the people were not out of hand, but they were in God's hand. 
for hours, great, did y'all hear that? Everybody say, for hours. For hours, great crying and groanings ascended, terrible conviction as some wrestled for forgiveness of sins. Others shouted in a mighty victory, praises of Zion and the Lamb. Others spoke in an unknown tongue as they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. It was like a holy jubilee. By the end of the week, nearly 200 had received the Holy Spirit. In another church in the capital, Buenos Aires, the same beautiful river of God began to flow, cleansing and healing and filling believers with the Holy Spirit, including several of the children of a missionary pastor and his praying wife. Doors were closed on the sultry summer night to protect unbelieving neighbors from the noise. Nevertheless, the cries and praises uh, were heard beyond the doors and it ascended heavenward. So he went on to see, after they got their breakthrough, he was praying eight hours a day, got his breakthrough, had the three others come, they got their breakthrough. He began to go minister in other churches and they began to see a move of God. You know what all this came out of? I can continue to read this. There was some awesome, there was a, a man uh, that got saved. And back, I, I want to read this actually. Let me read one more quick story. It says, in the midst of an unfriendly chocolate jungle, a hardy peasant folk from Europe had carved out cotton farms. They had known the movings of God in their homeland, but through great trials of faith and coming to the new land, wrestling, uh, resting homes, rather, homesteads, churches and farms from the hostile land and the bare hands and limited tools, they had lost their first love for the Lord. The elderly ones busy with farm life and business, the church was just a necessity. So the young people, church was a required habit. They were forced to go. How many knows that sometimes there's young people that are forced to go to church? But I'm telling you something as, as church leaders, let's intercede for them that they have an encounter with Jesus Christ. What was at the beginning? What was the first thing I said in this sermon tonight? People need an encounter with Jesus Christ. Then one day, Christmas time, 1950, the co-pastor and several of his members heard of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit among the Slavic-speaking folk, Buenos Aires, and they went there to visit. Witnessing the glorious work of the Holy Spirit, especially among the young people, inspired them to seek the Lord for themselves. Returning to Chaco, they shared firsthand reports of the work of the Lord in the South. A hunger grew in the hearts of the people, and they began to seek the Lord. The Holy Spirit moved among them. The young people who had laughed and mocked began to come to the Lord. You see? They had laughed and mocked, and they didn't want, They were forced to go to church, but yet, because of the prayers of the people, the Holy Spirit was moving, and the young people began to get saved. A young girl, listen to this, the most backslidden of the backslidden came to him in repentance and filled with the Holy Spirit. Older eyebrows were raised. <laughs> How can this be? The worst one of the whole bunch. But it spoke another message to the other young people. And they said to themselves, well, if God can forgive and baptize her in the Holy Spirit, there's hope for the rest of us. So they felt themselves strangely drawn to seek the Lord. They had come to the church to laugh and mock. One man, one young man, and some of you that knows the story will appreciate this. One young man named Alexander. He was known as the ringleader of the mischief among the young people. Had been standing at the church door making fun. He was half drunk that night, he felt, but he felt himself irresistibly drawn forward by a great wave of fire. Nearing the altar, he threw himself down. His laughter suddenly turned to mourning as he began to weep uncontrollably. In a moment's time, see, nobody was intellectually arguing with Alexander that night. Nobody was trying to tell him, well, you need to join our church and do this and don't do this. Nobody was there trying to get him to agree with a set of truths. What happened? The Holy Spirit drew this young man to salvation. The conviction of the Holy Spirit fell on him. He repented. And this was the young man for no, those that know the story that once Edward Miller started that Bible school, you remember? And he said that there was a young man out in the jungle that the angel of the Lord appeared to him and followed him back into the school and revival broke out in the school, and they wept and prayed. For, I believe it was two weeks straight or something like that, or maybe a couple months, deep intercession until it broke the heavens over Argentina. That young man was the one saved that night. Half drunk, he was the leader of the troublemakers. He came there to mock, standing at the front of the church, laughing and mocking, finds himself in the altar, weeping and getting saved. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. 
What I'm trying to encourage River of Life is this. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Keep praying. Keep interceding. Because I promise you there is a breakthrough on the near horizon. You guys, listen to what I'm saying. Jesus groaned before the dead was raised. God is groaning through you intercessors because he's about to raise the dead. He's about to raise up a revival. He's about to move. God doesn't put his groan in us unless we're groaning for something. You understand? God's got something he's about to do. That deep intercession that's in your belly, that deep intercession that you're praying is birthing souls for the kingdom. And as you're sowing in tears, I promise you, the day's coming where you're going to reap, you're going to weep for joy at the sheaves that are coming in, okay? So, Lord, we just thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for the power of God. And, Lord, we ask you let this be sealed in every heart. And like the days of old with George Whitfield, let us see the power of God fall upon the harvest. And, Lord, let us see a great harvest of souls come in. Let the sheaves be gathered in in these last days. In Jesus' name.